So before we dig into the lesson, I just want to throw out a reminder, I don't do this as often as I should, um, that we have a, a memory verse that we're trying to work through together. It's a, um, all of the classes, and I just, does anyone have committed Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 9 to memory and want to want to share that? Not as a way of showing off, but as a way of encouragement that it can be done. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, anybody? It's one of the first verses I came to love, and when I became a Christian a little bit later in life. For grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, so that no one may boast. Um, very, very powerful verse that really recenters us in many ways, but just encourage you to keep committing that to memory and working through it and doing that with uh, your loved ones, and your, especially your little ones at home. So, this week, uh, we're in Genesis 35, and spend most of our time in Genesis 35, and um, we're continuing to talk about Jacob and um, how God really led Jacob through um, some pretty deliberate exercises in Genesis 35 to, to get his mind and his heart pointed in a certain direction. And so just to ask if anybody, maybe to get the, to prime the pump for our conversation this evening, anyone think of a time in their life, maybe contrast, where you very much felt that you were in a valley and it was one of the, the worst seasons of your life that was maybe followed by something, I don't want to say it was the best day of your life, but that certainly made you look back on that differently. Kind of com comparing the good and the bad. Anybody have some bad seasons and some good seasons that came not too far apart? Ross? When our Scott and my mother died, it was probably the worst Amen. So, prior to your mother passing, you were not a believer. Is that what you're saying? No. no. Okay. So, Ross shared his, the death of, his, death of his mother, which is very tragic, and ultimately, in part, led to his accepting Christ. So, okay. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Yes? Uh, when we got orders to go to Guam, okay. uh, I wanted to go home back to Germany real bad because I wanted to convert my family, talk about God because we became Christians over here. And we were stationed in Guam and that was the best time because Guam prepared us for Germany because the trials we went through Guam, I needed them to stay faithful to Germany because Germany, my family, attacked uh, Christianity because they were Catholics and the whole tradition of Catholics and now you become a Christian, our religion's not good enough, so Guam prepared me for Germany. Hmm. Okay, Guam, a military assignment that you initially didn't want, right. ended up preparing you for, for Germany, the mm -hmm. place you wanted to go to begin with. But had you gone there, right away, or you said it wouldn't have gone as well as if you had gone to Guam first. Right. Okay, yeah. I think many of us who've got a military background can say, we don't have to go too far between assignments to think, oh dear God, the world is ending, you've forgotten about me, to oh, things aren't so bad all of a sudden. Um, yeah, that, that wheel spins pretty quickly for many of us. Anyone else? Yes. Christ 
10 34 tells me that I was accepted by Christ. It wasn't me accepting Christ, it was Christ and God accepting me. Amen. Because I submitted to his will to be baptized where the blood of Christ was that and water of baptism. Hmm. And when we were looking at Ephesians 2, where it was talking about, you know, by grace we're saved. And and we go a little farther, it says in 12 that, you know, in, before times we didn't have Christ, but then, in 13, but now the Christ, um, that in, in Christ Jesus, you are sometimes, you are far off, but now you're made nigh by the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ is in the waters of baptism. And Amen. I'm so happy that... Uh, I submitted to that and um, and and have been, been baptized in the church that Christ built. Amen. The um, the reason we're starting tonight's lesson out this way is here's the end goal for tonight: to ask ourselves how consistent and faithful are we in viewing the good times the same way we view the bad times. Do we do we at least make every effort, humanly speaking, and leaning on the Holy Spirit, to walk into the good as the same way we walk into the bad. Um, that's, that's where we're going tonight. That's what we want to ask ourselves. When the bottom falls out, are we as faithful as when we're on a mountaintop? And um, which, by the way, it was, I think, really by God's providence, Matt's lesson on Sunday was really rich in that regard. And we had a a great conversation on the way home about mountaintops and valleys and the difference between the two and what it means to, to level our lives. And um, so we'll, we'll kind of get into that here this evening. So um, that's where we're going tonight. We're going to spend our time in Genesis 35. If anyone's there already, can I get someone to uh, nice and loud read the first eight verses? Genesis 35, one through eight. Scott, thank you, brother. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Nurse, Rebecca's nurse died and was buried in the oak outside Bethel. So it was named Alon Bapu. Okay. Why would this be included in Scripture? Why is this story here? We're going to get to the wrestling in a minute, which is always a fun story, but why do we think this is included? Why does God do this with Jacob? So, Scott said, Jacob has changed. He is very much a different guy than, than he used to be prior to this set of experiences he had with God. Um, that, that's an important part that I think we should discuss with this is we changed over the course of our life, prayerfully for the better. Um, Hannah and I read a, a marriage book about a year, a couple summers ago maybe. It was just a really rich, good meeting, good book about marriage. And it talked about how everybody changes as we go through life. And one of the, the things that the husband and wife wrote together, and one of the things that the wife said was, I've been married to five men, and they've all been my husband. They've all been the same guy. But he's changed so much over the course of our 40-some years together that um, it's a different person than it was the guy when I met. Um, Jacob would certainly fit into that. He's a, he's a different guy. And, and I, I think that's certainly a part of this, maybe the biggest, the, the part of God leading him on this and sending him back is so that he can reflect. Reflect on what God has brought him through and the fact that he's, he's different. He's changed as a result of it. The question here for us to kind of sit and contemplate is, 
in addition to our salvation, what are some specific things that God has done for us? And the more specific, the better. How have you been blessed? I'll start. I have a wife who loves me in spite of me many times. Right? I'm a cantankerous guy, and she loves me anyway. I have a job I love. I actually like doing it. It's not just a way to put food on the table. I actually enjoy going to work most days. I'm not going to lie and say every day, but most days. Um, fairly healthy. I've got good shoes that work for me most of the time. Stuff I don't want to take for granted. I, uh, I remember I went on a mission trip years ago, and they gave grace, thanks, before we drink water. I was like 16, and that made a big impression on me. I, I don't think I ever thought about drinking water the same after that. But I never thought about it at all before that. So, what about you? What are we specifically thankful that God has done for us? Amen. I mean, to have someone that would come out at three in the morning and not expect to get paid for it, don't take that for granted. That's a blessing. Yeah, I'd rather not come out at three, but you know. We... Yes, Beth. You know, one of the things that we need to get from this exercise is we can have a tendency, all of us, no guilt implied at all, all of us can do this, have a tendency when like the bottom falls out and things get difficult to respond with some version of why me, which is, I think, in some ways human. It's human. It's not godly. It's human. It's human nature. Um, but really, a more helpful question would be to flip that and ask, well, why not me? I'm a sinner too, and, and I have, have not earned my salvation any more than you have. And so tough times have came my way. I live in a fallen world. I live in a fallen world. So why not me? And, and oh, by the way, I, I'm not going to hell one day. You know, and I got good shoes in the meantime. <laughs> uh, I don't mean to be flippant, but seriously, I, I think there's a lot of resilience in, in thinking that way. Um, so the follow-on question to this is, how are we deliberate about worship? Like worship and gratitude. Not just seeing worship as four songs we sing on Sunday morning, but a lifestyle that's in response to what we know we've received beyond what we deserve. <coughs> Any examples? Like what do you do? I would love to hear. What, what do you do that helps you stay thankful and have a posture of worship? Ross? I had a medical appointment today at the VA, and the ladies that dealt with me, my doctor and my uh, people who were working on the staff there, I'm 
try to try to be in this habit that I actually live today. Whenever anyone asks me, how are you doing? And my usual answer is, I'm so blessed by God, it's not fair to most others. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an easy way to say, I love God and I appreciate what he's doing in my life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. That's deliberate. That's practical. I like that. What else? What do we do? What do we say? What do we think that gives gratitude more real estate in our mind? Bob? You know, I, I heard a sermon years ago. Um, I think everything gets to be years ago. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, because uh, you hear people all the time talk about, you know, well, I didn't really get much out of worship today. Huh. And, or whatever. Or I didn't like this, or didn't like that, or whatever. And, and the sermon really talked about, and, and it's very, very clear in Scripture, worship has nothing to do about getting something. Amen. The whole concept of worship is to give. Amen. And, you know, the old concept to give, you know, you get what you give. Uh, and, what's, and so I think that, you know, anybody that knows me, I generally, I mean, I love to worship. And I, I love to sing and and I love, I mean, I just love worship. And in fact, somebody told me recently that, that and I, whoever they were talking about, I don't think liked it very much. But because they claimed that, they said, that, well, I think Bob's a charismatic. <laughs> and, and I don't, if you know what that means, and I don't consider myself a charismatic personality at all. But, but what they mean by that is that, well, I get, you know, I get, sometimes I get too excited. And, I, and if you know me at all, I'm very emotional. Well, I mean, that's who I am, and and uh, and I mean, I, I take worship very very serious. And in fact, one of the struggles that I've had when I leave worship is to see people not worshiping. Mm. I mean, whether you're a big singer or you don't like to sing or do whatever, you can engage, you can even listen to. It. And the whole purpose we assemble really is the scriptures are clear: is we come together to encourage one another. Yeah. And so I think that people see that. I would like to think that because of the way I try to be, because that's who I am, I would like to think that people are encouraged by the fact that I want to engage in worship. I don't sing loud or get engaged in singing loud because I love to sing. I do it because I really, I love to worship God. I really, really do. Mm. And I have for as long as I can. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I've heard that before, some version of, I didn't get any kind of worship today. Well, you weren't supposed to. If that wasn't the point of it, or something along those lines. I'm simplifying it, but Scott? Yeah, sometimes I just get this starting with Shirley and, and just start saying, well, I'm thankful for <coughs> this, or I'm thankful for that, and, you know, then she'll say, well, I'm thankful for this, and, you know, we just kind of have this thank fest. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't last very long, but just, just to verbally say things that we're thankful for, and usually involves each other as well, but you know, especially with this cold weather we've had, uh, you know, I'm thankful for a warm house, warm clothes, warm car, warm food. I mean, it doesn't take a lot to really, you know, just come up with a, a quick five, ten things that you're thankful for and you, you just stop and think about it. Yeah. Amen. Well, let's keep moving. I want to get through at least the bulk of this today. Um, but we'll keep this conversation going with the next, the next piece of scripture. Can someone read the next... Uh, 9 through 15. Genesis 35, 9 through 15. Ross, thanks.
to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at, that, at the place where God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. All right. So at this point, Jacob has been through quite a few valleys, um, some of them self-imposed, as some of our valleys are, self-imposed. Uh, but God's showing him here, and someone said, I think Scott said it pretty early on, that while this very much changed Jacob, in many ways we would hope for the better, it also showed Jacob that God hadn't changed at all, which I think is, is important for us to stop and remind ourselves from time to time. That's really good news, that God hasn't changed. We're, we're the ones who do the changing. He, he doesn't. Um, and to show the, just the wholesale nature of Jacob's change here, what, what does he do? It's fairly common in Scripture. What happens to Jacob here? Gets him a whole new name. Gets him a whole new name. And there's a lot of examples in Scripture through, of, of doing that. And I, I love just the imagery that comes from that. Because we... we I think with, from a good intention, a good place, we tell people, you know, you need to like turn over a new leaf and turn a corner and get in a better part of your life. But the gospel is, that's not what the gospel says at all. It says you, you, you need to die. Like there's, there's no improvement to be made upon this. There's no leaves to be turned over. You just, your sinful self needs to die and then be replaced by an entirely new person that, well, that God creates in you. Um, and he shows us that over and over and over and Many of you know some of our kids are adopted. One of the things that I just didn't really expect was they got a new birth certificate. When the adoption was over and finalized and legal and done, they got a whole new birth certificate. And if you look on that birth certificate, we are listed as the birth parents. And it no, there's no indication on that thing that these kids were ever adopted. That's, that's a gospel sermon in itself. We didn't see that coming. I didn't expect that. Um, but that's, how we're, that's, exactly, that's exactly how God sees us in every way. No indication whatsoever. Right? That there was a a previous sinful version. God knows it's there, of course, because he had to you know, kill it and revive it with something much better. But um, that's what happens with Jacob here. And God's weaving in some instructions that he's been giving him all along. And so one of the questions here, uh, and again, they're wanting us to be, I want us to be very specific. Because he tells Jacob some things like, you know, go here and be fruitful and multiply and build, build this pillar and use this as a reminder. What are some things in Scripture that God specifically tells us to do? Okay. One of my favorite scriptures when I first became a Christian is from Psalms I don't know where. It says, when, that, when you said to me, seek ye my face, my heart said to you, my God, by faith I shall seek. And I just love that. Okay. And that's what he wants. Look seek him. Look for him. Look for his ways. Look for his ways. We were last Sunday, uh, Wednesday in the back, and I think Ross said it, quoted one of my favorite verses. It's very practical. Acts 2.42. Was it you, Ross, that quoted that last week? Um, seeking me, like following the apostles' teaching and breaking bread and fellowship and prayer. We, we've been doing that for 2,000 years. And that's some very practical stuff. And so when we get together on Sunday or in life groups and we do that, that that's, we are building, and that's really the next point of this lesson, we're building layers of salvation history and we're a part of that. Breaking bread and salvation, or prayer and, and fellowship. Um, it's no small thing. It's no small thing. And that's really the next question here is, so we, I want to keep hearing if you have answers on, what are some specific things God said, do this? A another one, would, the next question here would be, how do you see God using you to advance his kingdom? How do you see yourself in his bigger plan for the world? Seeking and saving the lost? Seeking and saving the lost? Yep, okay. Bob? Well, I, yeah, I'd say that definitely. And, and one of the things is, you know, that I thought of a minute ago is, you know, Scripture says, let no one hold some word for safe in your mouth. Only such a word is good for education, for the building up of one another in love. But I, anybody that knows me knows I love to play golf. Well, most of the guys I have settled on playing golf with the last couple of years aren't Christians. And in fact, a couple of them have pretty bad mouths. But I know over the course of a couple of years, 
years, you know, they begin to notice that I don't laugh at certain things, and I don't say the same things that they say. And 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 I and especially this last fall, it seemed like there was several of those guys were really, you know, beginning to really kind of change their own their own terminology and saying things, and and they would, you know, and again, and then eventually doors open up to where. Because people actually appreciate that you aren't that way. They do, yeah. But they're really, you know, and their wives, you know, if you go to dinner with them, their their wives are kind of stuff. Most, you know, there's a few, there's exceptions to them, but I know most of their wives don't really appreciate some of the things they say in their language. And so it's just a matter of, uh, and again, seeking to save the lost is the goal, but something uh, probably, maybe one of the most successful ministers history of America is a guy from Phoenix who's part of a movement that has been very, very successful. And I was asking the guy if I could, maybe he could line me up with golf with the guy one time. And I said, what do you think? Maybe you and Don and I could go play golf sometime. And he said, that would never happen. And I said, oh, why not? And he said, because Don doesn't. The guy riding it, Don plays a lot of golf, and the guy riding it, Don's cart is always in those trees. Wow. I love that. And that's the example hmm. he sets for the people that he ministers to, is that that's what we all want to do. No, I love that. And if you look at Jesus, the biggest criticism amen. they had of him is who he hung out with. Amen. The biggest, amen. Hmm. I love that. What else? What are we told to do? And as a result of the things we're told to do, how do we fit in to salvation history? What's that? How do we fit in? Like, you know, you ever read Hebrews 11? We talk, like the Hall of Faith, we talk about it. And you ever done the exercise so you read, and by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith... You ever said, and by faith Bob? Right, by faith Ross, by faith Bev? Like, how would you complete that sentence? As you... Certainly, through the Holy Spirit and for God's glory, but how, as you help to build layers of salvation history for God's kingdom. Scott, was the hand up over here? Yeah. Uh, one thing God wants us to do is make disciples, which is a little bit more than what was shared earlier. So a, a disciple is someone who thinks like Jesus, does what Jesus does, and becomes like Jesus. And that's a lot harder than just someone, quote unquote, becoming a Christian. Now, it should be one and the same, but in our practice, it's not always the biblical reality. Mm. And so, you know, how I can fulfill that uh, legacy is I can be involved in discipleship. Mm. Amen. Making disciples. Yeah. Ross? I think it's scripture that says, Be holy, because I am holy. Um, and then we read that uh, Core 52 book, and there was a really great chapter about that in there. And it said, if we're in Christ, we are holy. You are a holy man. So am I. And so is every brother and sister in here. We are holy men and women. But I think that scripture tells us, you are holy, act like it. Act like it. Live act like it. it. Yeah, amen. Yeah. I think holy and saint, which is really the same root word there, are some of the most misunderstood and misused words in the text because we act like it's something we have to earn. In, in many traditions, that's how they treat it. Um, but it's, it's just what we are, and then we're supposed to go act like it as a result of that. Yeah, amen. Anybody else? The, the follow-on question, we got a few minutes left here, was, I'm not going to read the rest of the text because it's kind of short on time, which is fine. We've had a good, I think, good conversation. What are some blessings that we may be prone to take for granted? And how might reviving those in our hearts help us approach the bad times with as much faithfulness as we approach the good times? If that makes, if that makes sense. What do we take for granted? And how might that, yes? Um, I think one thing being involved in like my demographic, which would be like mothers of school aged children. One thing that I see a lot is that um, it's trendy to talk bad about your kids. 
like moms will get together and it'll be oh and I just can't stand them and you know and I well, you know COVID they were home all day and it's like those are your kids <laughs> you made them you made kids. them <laughs> <laughs> so or like the the wine mom culture oh I just can't wait to open that bottle of wine at, at you know when the kids go to bed kind of thing um, that I think that's kind of taking blessings for granted because those are like really core blessings and talking about disciple making, those are the very first disciples that you make. Not first, but one some of the most important ones, you know, and that's kind of like the true test of whether you can make a disciple is can you raise, you know, children who stay being believers. That's what I think anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big thing that I see and that I do. Sometimes I'll take my kids for granted and they're some of my biggest blessings too. Amen. And, and the whole point of this, if I can just kind of jump on top of that, this D6, the whole point of this D6 program is discipleship starts in the home. And we believe that 100%. But if I can just be honest and probably state the obvious, that's one of the hardest grounds to disciple. And I, and I say that because they see you at your best and your worst. You know, in, in some ways, I can kind of pick and choose when I spend time with certain people. Like my 12-year-old doesn't have that luxury. And so he sees, he doesn't just see good dad, like up here on stage, you know, he he sees bad dad, mad dad, you know, dad that throws a word out that he shouldn't say. And, and I got to disciple that. And then uh, that's, that's hard. And so that reminder that these little creatures that we made, you know, are going to be some of the most powerful disciples we unleash into the world. That's a, it's a blessing. It's also uh, some guardrails, you know, some bumpers for my behavior, prayerfully. Bob. Yeah, I really appreciate it. What Michelle brought up, what you're saying is that we, something hit me, I don't know how many years ago, that we raise our children, and, you know, it's like I didn't have any kids until I was in my 30s. And I've got 30 years of information that I look at my children through. So I'm basically raising my children through, you know, through a whole bunch of prejudice eyes. Our children see us clearly. They, they, have, they have no wow. opinion. Yeah. They, they just see us as clear as a bell. And when, that, when I realized that, I thought, oh my goodness. Uh -oh. and, uh, and I think... Well, oh, thanks, Bob. That ruined my night. You know, <laughs> you, know, you know how positive my wife is. Well, I'll tell you what. One of the best things we did, we did not allow baby blankets. Period. From day one. I mean, it was just not allowed. And, you know, and just, you know I remember Zig Ziglar, a lot of you have heard Zig Ziglar. You know, he would talk about the terrific twos, the tremendous threes, you know, instead of the terrible twos and the, yeah. you know, and this kind of stuff. And, and it really is a matter of, you know, that's an attitude we should have as Christians. And it starts, like you're saying, D6 starts in the home. Mm -hmm. And that attitude that, you know, uh, and you can, you know, Scott's an extremely positive guy, immaturely, and you see that in their two boys. I mean, you know, Chad and, and uh, Todd, <laughs> And I think not just the way we talk about our kids in front of our kids or when they're not around. I think the way we talk about other people. I would say specifically the church. What well, someone told me early on, if you're going to go into ministry, do not go into ministry at the cost of your family. Nobody wants to say I was a 50, you know, I was in ministry for five decades and all my kids hate the church. That's not a win at all. Um, and so we've been very deliberate. And there's been frustrations, of course, some big ones. Um, but we are careful about how we describe those in front of the kids and what we say about people in front of the kids, for our hearts as well. But all right, it's a couple minutes after, and we need to stop. I'll hang around if we want to keep chatting, but we've got to honor our teachers. So let me pray. God, thank you for letting us be here. I pray that we would be about making disciples, not disciples of ourselves, but disciples of your son, Jesus. May we not present ourselves as anybody's answer to any problem, but may we always present your son, Jesus, as the answer to every problem. Amen. All right, go get your kids.